Uh, I think it's time to get our bird on, so um, let's welcome Danny to the stage, our keynote speaker for the, for the Congress. so many people here and you've come, many of you have come a long way and I'm guessing that you're here because you've heard about the famous shorebird populations in Roebuck Bay so that's what I thought I'd talk about. Uh, I'm going to talk <coughs> about what you're likely to see but not so much about the actual species you'll see. I'll, I'll try and talk about what you'll see the birds doing and why they're doing it or at least how I interpret that and hopefully lead on to giving you an understanding of why it's relevant to their conservation. Uh, oh, just some stats down there at the bottom. There's over 150,000 shorebirds in Roebuck Bay. 18 species occur in internationally significant numbers. It makes it pretty much the most important shorebird, shorebird site in Australia, up there with 80 Mile Beach and the southeast Gulf of Carpentaria. These little things in the corner, that, uh, those are just the citations of the papers if you want to follow things up. Sooner. They're, they're looking a bit small, but you're all bird watchers, so you'll have binoculars, so it's okay. <laughs> my, my credentials, uh, I've been coming to Broome quite regularly since 1982, mostly for fun. Uh, I managed to drag out a PhD on shorebird, shorebird ecology here from 1997 to 2006, and you'll see a lot of that stuff here in the talk as well. Uh, so, shorebird basics. You, you may also have heard shorebirds <laughs> referred to as waders. Uh, English and European people tend to call them waders. Americans tend to call them shorebirds. In Australia, we're bilingual, we speak. <laughs> we use either term. They're, they don't really have a formal tax taxonomic definition, but they're in the order charadriforms, they're leggy, they're mainly in open habitats, especially wet wetlands and coasts. And here you've got Eastern Curlew, the world's largest shorebird. It, it's ejecting a pellet, that's why it's looking a bit strange. And scaled fairly accurately next to it is Redneck Stint, one of our smallest shorebirds. Uh, they're, they're quite diverse in habits and habitats. Uh, some shorebird species are t exclusively coastal, like they only feed on tidal flats. Uh, uh, some are uh, only found on non-tidal wetlands and some can move between the two. Uh, some shorebirds are uh, residents, that, well we call them resident, they, they breed in Australia or New Zealand and they spend the non-breeding season in Australia or New Zealand, although there's sort of local movements. But the thing that makes shorebirds really spectacular to many people is the amazing migrations they do from one side of the world to the other. And it's a very strange thing when you go out for a walk on the tidal flats of Roebuck Bay or 80 Mile Beach, you'll see thousands of birds out there. 95% uh, of individuals will be birds that bred on the other side of the world, 10 to 12,000 kilometres away. Uh, just to summarise the lifestyle a bit more, I'll use great knot as an example here. So in, in their breeding season, which is June, July, they're in the highlands of the, the Anadir Highlands of Siberia. They're, they're, they're up in the mountains, they're above the Arctic Circle, they're nesting in tundra. They're, they're quite solitary things. You've just got pairs scatter, scattered around at loose densities over a very large area. They lay their eggs on the ground very well. The, that bright breeding plumage that looks so striking here is incredibly well camouflaged when they're sitting on the tundra. They lay a clutch of four eggs. The chicks hatch. Uh, the chicks feed themselves, but they have to be brooded by the parents for a while because they can't until they can firm or regulate by themselves. All that happens in the space of six to seven weeks, and for the rest of the year, they're totally different in character. They're very gregarious, they occur in large flocks. They only feed on uh, tidal flats, so they're totally restricted to the coast. Uh, the non-breeding season, where they spend sort of at least seven months of it every year, is here in Northern Australia. And to get to Australia, and from Australia to the breeding grounds, and to get back again, they do amazing migrations with one serious stop in the Yellow Sea. Uh, it's hard to take in the scale of migration, so E7 is a great example. This is the world's most famous bar-tailed godwit, and it was, uh, it had a satellite, in, a satellite transmitter implanted by a team of scientists from Alaska and New Zealand. Uh, 
And we, we, a lot of us knew this was happening. We'd been really anticipating this study. Uh, and I, I remember when it happened, because I was actually here in Broome, and I checked my email and uh, there was a notification, E7 has just left Alaska, and that's, that's pretty cool. But I had a busy week in, ahead of me, and, uh, and I, I tell the story this way, so you, you really think about what happens while the short birds migrating. So the first day was super low tide, so I spent the day rock pooling, looking for benthos and so on, that was very nice. The next day there was a Lingbia conference in Broome. It's a nasty blue-green algae that's affected some of the mudflats near town. Next day a post-conference field trip. The next day I did a shorebird count. It didn't work, so the next day another shorebird count, hopefully getting it right. The next day went out to Lake Eda. Great day. Bushfire at the end. It took us ages to get back. It was an epic day. Had a rest day the next day and I checked my email and E7 was still flying. It hadn't stopped beating its wings once. It had been flying 24 hours a day, hadn't landed because there was nothing to land on. It was over an ocean. No gliding because shorebirds don't do that. It's all powered flight. Eight days later, after taking off from Alaska, it landed in New Zealand exactly where it had started off a few months before. It's, uh, shorebird migration is it's hard to take in the scale of it. It's just amazing. The endurance and the, just the audacity of flying across the biggest ocean of the world. And if you really think about it, you'll never feel sorry for yourself on a long haul flight again. <laughs> Some people have compared shorebirds to long distance high performance athletes. It's not a bad analogy, so I thought I'd draw it out a bit here. This is Chris Froome, who's won four, four tours to France. About the sort of most highly trained human athlete you can think of. Uh, and we'll compare him against a great knot. So a stage of the Tour de France is five hours. A uh, migratory stage for a red knot is five days, it's sort of winning. Uh, precision of start date, uh, Chris Froome knows to the minute when his Tour de France is going to start. Surprisingly, red knots know a lot, it's probably to within two or three days. The, the migration period sort of spread out over a few weeks. But individual birds, uh, research by Phil Batley is showing that they've got these incredibly tight schedules and the same individual will leave within a couple of days of each other every year. They've got a very good internal clock, so they, they, they have lots of, they know what they're preparing for. Uh, altitude training, every, every climbing cyclist has to do loads of endurance cycling, endurance uh, altitude training, so they build up the capacity of their blood to carry oxygen. Uh, shorebirds don't do that, they're, they're, all at, they're, they're at sea level for most of the time. But uh, they actually go to higher altitudes than Chris Froome does. We've, there's some recent, uh, there's a new generation of GPS trackers which are being put on the biggest shorebirds now. And the early results coming through are showing that when they're doing transoceanic crossings, mostly they're a couple of kilometres high. But at times they'll go up to five and a half kilometres to, high to exploit uh, cooler temperatures and uh, favourable winds. Navigation aids, not a problem for Chris Froome with race radio and crowds and all that. Uh, uh, the knots have to do their own migration. We think they use the sun, the stars, a magnetic compass and memory as their cues, but there's lots to find out about how they do it. Going a bit further, Chris Froome is a skinny guy, all, all, the, all the endurance cyclists are, and it, it's, an it's an energetic advantage. It's, you don't have to move so much weight when you're pushing a bike uphill. It would actually be very useful for shorebirds if they could do that too. Flight, flight theory says the lighter you are, the more efficiently you fly. In fact, they can't do that. Uh, they're certainly very skinny when they finish a migratory flight. That's what that thing's showing in the top right. Uh, but before they take off, they're very fat birds. Uh, the, the reason is uh, energy supplements. No, no tour cyclists can uh, finish a stage without eating on the way. Uh, so they have energy bars. But they don't carry themselves. Them themselves, they're carried by a team car, but shorebirds have to carry their own stuff, carry their own supply. They carry it in the form of fat, they build up the fat on the non breeding grounds, and that is why foraging on the non breeding grounds is so important to them. So, we're in Roebuck Bay, the shorebirds will be here for about seven months, from about September to March. While they're here, the, one of their main jobs is to molt their flight feathers. The, um, is this pointer working? Yeah. Anyway, you can see in the wing it's got growing flight feathers. Uh, shorebirds have. Thanks very much. Uh, <laughs> hmm. 
time to get it right then. <laughs> oh, well, fly, fly feathers. Shorebirds depend on these flight feathers to fly. They need them for migration. They don't last forever. They have to replace them every year. And the non-breeding grounds is where they do it. It's a quite a gradual process. It takes them four or five months. It's one of the main reasons they're here. Soon as they have done their migration, uh, as soon as they've done their flight feather molt, they start to put on, that's when they start to put on heaps of food. And the weight gain is quite dramatic. This is weight gain in a redneck stint because uh, from Victoria, because that was the only graph I happened to have, but they, they almost double their mass in six to seven weeks before they fly off, and that's when they really need decent food supplies. That's not happening right now, though. Right now, the waders are coming back to Roebuck Bay, and uh, the, the timing of their arrivals is quite known from a paper by Jimmy Choi and me. Uh, we, we have repeated counts from a lot of the flyway. Uh, these, these are sites where people have counted waders at quite regular intervals uh, during the same season. Uh, th this is a, our Roebuck Bay example. Uh, these were counts that my dad and I did back in 2007. We s did a count a week in Roebuck Bay for a while. And you run a simple statistical model through that and then you can work out the average time of arrival and so on, which we did for a lot of sites. Uh, so, and with the model you can predict uh, migration timing. It differs between species, so uh, greater sand plover and eastern curlew, for example, they're early migrants, and nearly all of the greater sands and the eastern curlew of Roebuck Bay have arrived already. At the other end of the scale, godwits and tatlers and stints uh, more come, come down a bit later. We've only got about half the numbers that will be here later in the season. Uh, but those are not the only shorebirds you're going to see in Roebuck Bay. You're going to see... Uh, well, the arriving shorebirds you see, you'll see a variety of plumages. If you're lucky, you might see birds in full breeding plumage. This is curly sandpiper, but most of them will have started molting. If you're very lucky, you'll see f recently arrived juveniles in fresh juvenile plumage. Very pretty, but they mainly start turning up in October. Mostly, you're going to see birds in, that have already got molted into non-breeding plumage, or you'll see birds that are just <coughs> returning, and they've got big blotches of breeding plumage to help you pick them out. Uh, but you'll also see quite a lot of birds that never migrated north. They're not in identical plumage to the adults, but it takes, it's, it's not easy to pick them apart. But if you look closely, you'll often see sort of glimmers of non-breeding plumage, of breeding plumage, sorry, not fully developed. So these, these dark centres to the feathers are broader than they would be in a full non-breeding bird. This one's got these little buffy flecks in the underparts, which kind of foreshadow what the adults have. So you might have fun trying to pick those out. But what are these birds, these that didn't bother to migrate? They're, they're basically young birds, and we know this from banding records. When you look at the age of birds captured during the dry season from June to early ju July, and to make sure we're not getting anything wrong, we can find the analysis initially to uh, birds that were banded when they were very young, so they're really easy to age and we reca recaptured them, and these were the ages. So uh, you'll see for most species, nearly all of the birds we caught in the dry season were in their first year, but in some species, quite a few birds, 37% of the godwits, for example, were in their second year, and a few birds were in their third year, uh, and then there was just a few adults that uh, didn't migrate north because they didn't reach the condition they needed. So you've got lots of young birds that don't bother migrating north in their first year. They, they, stay in they get to Australia, and they, they come down quite slowly on their first southwards migration. They reach Australia, and then they stay here for a full year or more before they start considering migrating north and breeding. We, we've got other sources of information on how many of these birds there are. The wader banders assign age to birds on the basis of molt characters, and for most species, you can do it very well. This is a redneck stint. Uh, uh, this is a second year redneck stint, and a wader bander could look at the wing and tell you that. He, uh, they'd say, look, there's uh, seven oldish inner primaries, and then there's a molt contrast, and the outer four, uh, sorry, it's four, isn't it? So six, six oldish inner primaries, and then four new, newer outer primaries. That's a signature. It tells you that a bird's in its second year. It's just molted the four outer primaries to get it through. There, there's clues like that that help you age birds. You also get clues when you compare counts you do in winter with counts you do in summer, because uh, if you consider a bird that uh, doesn't start migrating north until it's three years old, your winter counts will have some first-year birds and some second-year birds, 
and some third year birds, so the winter counts will form a higher proportion of the summer counts when everything's here than they will in a bird that uh, starts migrating back when, it, when it's very young. So we, we tied together these lines of evidence to uh, find the age of northwards migration in 37 species of shorebirds that migrate to Australia annually. Uh, and, and basically we got a, we came up with some, sorry, uh, some species uh, don't delay my maturity at all. Little curlew, swinhose snipe, oriental pratt and coal, long-toed stint, sharp-tailed sandpiper, wood sandpiper, oriental plover. They, they're ready to go back and, to the breeding grounds and start breeding before, before they're a, a year old. Uh, but then there are some species that always delay maturity for one year. Common green shank, teric sandpiper, grey plover, redneck stint, sorry, curlew sandpiper, broad-billed sandpiper, redneck stint. Then there are some species that uh, del delay maturity for one, always delay it for one year and sometimes delay it for two, black-tailed godwit, ruddy turnstone, grey-tailed tattler. And then there are species that often delay maturity for, I'm sorry, I hate it when I make mistakes. Uh, that's of course a wandering tattler on the bottom right. Uh, then there are species that delay maturity for at least for two years, sometimes for three years. They've got long delayed maturity. Eastern curlew, Bar-tailed godwit, red knot, great knot, wimbrel. So why does the age of first breeding vary? We, we did a comparative analysis to see whether it was related to various life history indices. Uh, so we compared it with breeding productivity. The thinking was that birds that produce more offspring uh, uh, might want to start breeding earlier because they normally survival is correlated with fecundity. So if you're a f if you have high fecundity, you normally have lower survival. So we so assessed whether age of first breeding was related to clutch size. We assessed whether it was related to the uh, distance of north, the distance that they migrate, because it's quite different between some shorebird species. This greater sand plovers, for example, would nest somewhere around Mongolia, northern China. Uh, and on the, on the other hand, uh, something like uh, red knots, from Robot Bay would be nesting right up in the New Siberian Islands. So there's some variation there. We thought it might be related to size because uh, larger species tend to have sort of slower life histories, grow up slower. And we also looked at non-breeding habitat. What came out of it was basically this. Uh, fecundity, no effect. Clutch size doesn't affect the age of first bre breeding in shorebirds. Uh, that's probably because it's capped. Shorebirds never lay more than four eggs in a clutch. They can actually, they could actually incubate more than four eggs, but they couldn't bring up more than four chicks because shorebird chicks can't uh, keep themselves warm in cool temperatures. Uh, so what they do is they run off and feed, and every 10, 20 minutes or so, they run back to their mum or their dad, and they press the back of their neck against their mum or dad's brood patch. The back of the neck has uh, some blood vessels very close to the surface. There's, instant transfer of heat, and that's how they keep alive. But there's only space for four backs of necks against every adult shorebird, so that limits their breeding productivity. Uh, distance from breeding grounds didn't have an effect on age of first breeding. That might be because all our data came from Australia, and uh, wherever the birds breed, they're a long way from Australia. So I, I suspect that if you'd done the same study on birds in Asia, you may have found an effect, but down here, it, no effect at all. Size does have a modest effect. Bigger species take longer to grow up. That's eastern curly and redneck stint again. And non-breeding habitat has a very strong effect. Shorebirds of coastal habitats take much longer to mature than shorebirds of non-tidal habitats. Uh, so you take uh, long-toed stint, exclusively a bird of freshwater wetlands, doesn't delay maturity, always goes back uh, when, just before it's a year old, redneck stint, most of the, our population is coastal. They always take two years to grow up. So why would coastal species take longer to grow up? Uh, my, my theory is it's because young birds don't forage as efficiently as adults and they may, may find it harder to fuel on schedule. And two things could contribute to that. Firstly, tidal flats are exposed for 12 hours a day. When the tide's high, the shorebirds can't feed. Birds on a freshwater wetland can feed for as long as they like, and they actually do. If you take a spotlight or some night viewing equipment out to a freshwater wetland and watch shorebirds, they're eating through most of the night as well as through a lot of the day. I also think it takes longer to learn how to forage on a tidal flat. 
And uh, to try and put my case forward, I've just described foraging in freshwater wetlands for a shorebird, that the big challenge for them is finding wetlands with enough food, because temporary wet freshwater wetlands that are suitable for shorebirds are normally temporary. So the average, and the average prey abundance on freshwater wetlands isn't especially high. The biomass is lower than it is on a tidal flat. But there's pulses when there's lots of food, so the challenge is finding, finding a wetland at the right time. It's also very important to find water of suitable depth, because most shorebirds feed while wading, and they've got very specific depth preferences. So a redneck stint really likes shallow water, just to film around its toes, one to two millimetres deep. Uh, Sharp-tailed sandpiper, happiest in water that's sort of uh, one to five centimetres deep. Curly sandpipers like to forage with their feet wet, the water's preferably three to five centimetres deep and so on. Every species has got a different preference, but between them they've got all the, they've got all the wetland covered. Uh, the simple side of foraging in non-tidal wetlands is the prey. In saline wetlands, uh, very salty ones, the water's too salty for fresh fish and other predators, so there's a few hardy invertebrates that get to it. incredibly high densities, such as brine shrimp. They're at such high densities that foraging's easy for a shorebird. Freshwater ponds, norm the, the, the diet of freshwater shorebirds almost always turns out to be coronamid larvae, such as this. And they're, they're, they're great as prey, they're, uh, they're quite nutritious. They're, uh, they're, they're really slow, they, they, and they, they don't burrow much. They're, they're just sort of in this film on the bottom of the wetland. You can stir, the waders can stir them up with their feet, and they just float around helplessly, and they get eaten. Not only that, they're bright red, so uh, <laughs> it's not hard for a shorebird to find them. So I, I don't think there's much skill in actually eating those. On a tidal flat, though, it's different. The, the benthic fauna in the tidal flat is very diverse. You'll hear more about this from other speakers. And uh, lots of migratory shorebirds are very specialised in coastal habitats. So to take an example, red knots and, gra red knots and great knots exclusively eat bivalves, or almost exclusively eat bivalves. So these are clams, mussels, that sort of thing, two shells. Uh, they find them buried in the mud, they pull them out, they swallow them. In, they swallow them whole. If you're really, really close, you can hear a crunch as they squash them in the gizzard. And the gizzard is one of the things that's specialised for that lifestyle. A red knot gizzard is very enlarged, so same size as the gizzard of an oyster catcher, although oyster catchers also eat bivalves, but they take them out of the shell first. But a gizzard has a, the same size, a red knot has a gizzard the same size as an oyster catcher, uh, just so it can deal with prey. They can actually manipulate the size of the gizzard, so if they have some soft shell prey, their gizzard gets small, but if they get into a place where the only bivalves are hard shelled, they very quickly build their gizzard size up. More specialisations, the bill tip is packed with these sensory tips, uh, sensory pits, and the sensory pits are packed with herps corpuscles, very special, specialised nerve receptors which re detect pressure differentials. And red knots use this quite cleverly, they tap the mud with their bill, it sends out pressure waves, it's, uh, which go out in all directions, the pressure waves go through the pore water in the mud, um, if the pressure waves hit a hard object, the signal's reflected back, it's a bit like echolocation, and the knots pick up that signal with their bill tip, and uh, in experiments they can pick up a, they can find a buried stone from five centimetres. So it's, it's great for finding buried prey at fairly low densities. But there's a lot of buried stuff in a tidal flat. Uh, some of what they'll find there is what they really want. So Shellfish in the gene, bivalves in the genus Tolina, relatively thin shells, lots of meat, they love those. In Roebuck Bay, the, the best shorebird prey we've, for knots is uh, Siliqua modi. Siliqua, it's, a, it's got a very thin shell, it, it's, got, it's packed with meat, it's a very lively sort of bivalve. Uh, and that's good food, but then you've got lots of bivalves they can't eat. So Anadara, some of the cock lots of the cockles here are just too big for a short, a great knot to swallow, and some are very heavily armoured with spikes and things, so that shell shorebirds don't eat them. Uh, so you've got all that sort of stuff in the mud flat that they can't eat, and of course every shellfish dies; it leaves its shell there. There's loads of buried objects that are totally inedible. And I, I reckon it must take some skill to learn how to use that information they're getting from the bill tip. And if you look at the intake rates, uh, this is the energy that birds take in per, per second uh, uh, when they're foraging. Uh, adults have a high intake rate, first year birds have a low intake rate, second year birds are sort of in between. Uh, but 
very conveniently, not sometimes switch from foraging by touch for bivalves to foraging by sight for amphipods and especially shrimps. If there's shrimps around, they go crazy. They have to chase them. And the foraging success of first-year birds and adults when feeding by sight for shrimps is pretty much the same. Uh, but when they're feeding by touch and hunting bivalves, adults are very good at it. Young birds are rubbish. They're, they're really quite clumsy. They quite often pick up things they can't eat and they throw them away. So I, I, that's, that's my case for arguing that uh, shorebirds find it harder to learn how to feed on a tidal flat. As for where they feed on the tidal flat, this red dotted line indicates where the tidal flats extend to roughly on a spring low tide. Uh, and he, you have a walk up on them, which I thoroughly recommend on your visit to Broome. Uh, shorebirds look, might look very uniform when you look at them from the edge, but when you start walking over them, they're not a uniform in the top, not in the slightest bit uniform. In Roebuck Bay, for example, you'll find lovely coarse sand flats to, at the Broome end of the bay and also towards Bush Point. The deeper you go into the bay, the muddier the sediments get, and walking around in this part of the world is not good fun at all. Uh, but I've done quite a bit of it because uh, I, I used to do counts of uh, where shorebirds were feeding at low tide. So every one of these dots is uh, a site where benthos was sampled by the programs that Grant and Andrew and Sora will be talking about. I, I had a 200, 200 metre square around each block and I used to count the shorebirds in it walking out to each one. And it was very nice indeed walking on these these flats and doing the counts at low tide. In the Eastern Bay it wasn't so nice, it was very hard work walking through the mud and uh, when you stopped it got even harder because you'd set your telescope kind of low, so you look like that, and then you start sinking and sinking and sinking as you go through and then you stop counting because you can't reach your telescope anymore. <laughs> uh, and this is uh, some of the distribution maps I got. This one's for Gullbill Turn. Uh, Subspecies Macrotarsa, which I used to see standing around the mudflats. I didn't know why I counted them anyway. The, the second thing is normally an index of what we consider their prey, but I've put the Wimbrel map here. The, so the shading represents Wimbrel density and the round circles represent uh, gullbill terns. Curious thing was that uh, gullbill terns were always in the same grid square as a Wimbrel, or right next to a grid square with a Wimbrel. And I gradually, I, I eventually worked out why, because it turned out the, the gullbill terns were not s sitting on a mud flat having a rest. They were sitting on a mud flat staring at wimbrels, which were hunting large crabs. And when the wimbrel caught a crab, the gullbill tern would fly over and beat up the wimbrel and steal the crab. Uh, it was often quite an equal fight, and sometimes the fr crab got broken into pieces and the birds got half each. But exciting to watch. Uh, and then there were different patterns. Black-tailed godwit really likes the sloppy sediment around south of Crab Creek that was mostly down there. Uh, on, in contrast, there's not much food for grey-tailed tattlers in that sloppy stuff. They like the firmer tidal, tidal flats in the west of the bay. Uh, redneck stints uh, and teric sandpipers. Uh, uh, the, the key thing I was going to show here is that they don't go out all the way to the tide edge. They're mostly on uh, tidal flats near shore or so somewhere in the middle. Red not, redneck stints occur pretty much everywhere. Uh, Terex sandpipers are uh, quite patchy. There's a, a lot of them feeding on the Dampier Creek flats, quite a lot in front of the observatory where the sediment's totally different. Uh, and and that's, those are still foraging strongholds today, although I did this mapping in 97. Uh, but in contrast, in contrast to these birds that like the sort of inner tidal flats, you've got birds like Godwits and knots, which all have always follow the sea edge quite closely, and uh, they're, they're mostly next to the water's edge. That's where you find the big numbers. And uh, we did some experiments to try and figure out why that was, and it was because they were hunting prey that uh, doesn't like get, getting desiccated at high tide. So bivalves, they, they stick their foot out and, fo to, and use it to forage when the tidal flats are covered with water. But uh, when the tide goes out, they burrow deeper so that they don't get dried out. And as they burrow deeper, they get out of reach of shorebirds. So if shorebirds follow the receding tide edge closely, they can catch the food that they want to before it's out of reach. Uh, tidal flats are not... Uh, uh, for 12 hours a day, the tidal flats of Roebuck Bay uh, submerge. <coughs> and and at, that, at those times, shorebirds gather in flocks at sites that are called roosts. 
It's a, it's a bit of a misleading name because when shorebirds are roost, they're not always roosting. More often than not, they're not sleeping. They're just loafing and preening and looking around for danger. They, they uh, look at, if they see anything scary coming, they take off and get on the wing. When, when they're on the ground like this, they're, they're vulnerable. They, can, they take a little while to take off. Once they're in the air and full in, flying at full speed, almost nothing can catch a shorebird. Uh, and in the late 19, by the late 1990s, we knew the northern beaches of Roebuck Bay were very spectacular shorebird roosts, and we knew roughly when shorebirds would be there and when the cannonettes could catch them. But we didn't know where shorebirds roosted on neat tides and where they roosted on spring tides and where they roosted at night. So I'll go into those studies, but uh, just as background for those of you who haven't sp spent much time on mudflats, uh, just a, an explanation of tides. So when, when the full moon, the, the tides are caused by the gravitational pull of the sun and the moon. And when the sun and the moon are uh, much in line, in line the, 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 tidal, the gravitational pull is in much the same direction. So the water sort of comes out, it, it sort of bulges further from the centre of the earth and you, you have bigger tides. When the gravitational pull of the moon and the sun are opposing each other, you have smaller tides, neaps, which we call neaps. And um, neap tides, you have a very low tidal range. It's uh, just a few metres. That's shown by the grey shading in this graph. Spring tides, you have a very big tidal range, so the uh, high tide comes up a very long way. The low tide goes out a long, very long way. The tidal range in Roebuck Bay is up to 10 metres on the very biggest spring tides, which is amongst the world's biggest tides. Uh, and also the tides get half... The black dots are just demonstrating that the tides run half an hour later every day, roughly. Uh, so with that background in mind, uh, we'll go on to the radio tracking study we did of roosts back in 2000 on the Tracking 2000 expedition. As we wrote a couple of papers about it. Um, we attached small radio tags to 25 great knots and to 23 red knots. This is one of the radio tags being glued to the rump plumage. Uh, once the bird had preened itself, all you could see of it was the antenna coming out of the back. Uh, uh, we released the birds and we tracked their movements with an array of automatic radio tracking stations around the bay. Uh, that, these are shown by the black dots. Most of them are around the northern shores of Roebuck Bay. We had one station at Bush Point. Uh, one or two stations that might come as a surprise. Uh, we had one at Simpsons Beach where uh, it turned out there were a lot of shorebirds at the time. We had one at the, right here at the Mangrove Hotel, which was a very popular station when we were doing battery changes. <laughs> it, it commanded the tidal flats of Dampier Creek very nicely. And also, uh, Chris had done some serious research at the uh, Mangrove Hotel. Uh, he, he, he used to have, he was very dedicated. He used to have to come here for dinner. And uh, as dusk fell, uh, you used to get, on, in some conditions, you used to get flocks of knots sweeping through the searchlights, the spotlights here, and flying over the town of Broome. Uh, after careful research by Chris, we found that uh, the birds were actually flying to Cable Beach, uh, not, not the most touristy bit of Cable Beach, a little bit further south. There's a big blowout in the dunes, so just nice white dunes uh, fronting onto the beach, and no, no street lights, and the waders roost there at night. It's a quite remarkable sight. So if you go in there really quietly with a torch, a lot of the waders are actually sleeping and you can sort of creep up to within, within five metres or less of them. It's, it's, it's a lovely sight. Uh, but you mustn't say you all know too loudly because you'll scare them off. They're very flighty. Uh, the, the stations, we, most of them we put on um, high ground of some sort, on cliff tops and the like, and uh, that was fine. Each station had an antenna connected by cable to a box in which we had a receiver and a little computer to log the data. Uh, we had a couple of sites in mangroves and uh, at Dampier Creek and in the Crab Creek mangroves. We had to build towers for those and uh, we, we put those up. It was fun putting them up uh, but we carefully observed OH&S protocols so it was all right. Uh, we, we got about six million records from the automatic radio tracking stations uh, and we could summarise them in graphs like this for every bird. So here, along the bottom axis you've got uh, the time of day. Uh, along this axis uh, you've got the, um, the day of the month. It's, it's a fairly ugly graph because we were just using these in the field to check, see how things were developing and uh, check that our equipment was working. 
But you can see patterns in this when you get your eye in. So this, this area where things are messy, is, it, it's a neat tide. And on neat tides, we found that all the birds in the bay basically went to one area in the east of the bay on the Crab Creek Flats. But at, on intermediate tides, the bird, this bird was feeding at Quarry Beach and sometimes at Simpsons Beach, sometimes Eagle's Roost. And, uh, and at night, it was always roosting on Cable Beach. And you can see the uh, tides moving late, and that's why these lines are diagonal. A anyway, we, ha we had that sort of information from 48 birds, and we uh, tried to thread it into a model. We recorded habitat attributes at every site where we were radio tracking and uh, assess their contribution to the roost selection by knots. Uh, microclimate turned out to be incredibly important. So, uh, uh, Robot Bay, can, it, it, it can be hot up here. And uh, it is hot up here. Uh, it, shorebirds don't cope very well with heat because they're carrying a plumage that they're also going to be carrying on the breeding grounds where temperatures are only just above zero and quite often below zero. So. Often they'll get to the breeding grounds and have a late snowstorm and uh, they'll be digging through snow to try and find something to eat. So they need a plumage that can cope with that and, uh, well, you'd know it's hard to find clothing that you'd wear in Broome and that you'd wear in the Arctic. Uh, so they, they have um, ploys to deal with it. Uh, when, when they're very heat stressed, they'll pant. This is something you normally only see after, a, after they've been flying because it costs energy and water. Uh, often they'll just lift the feathers on the back of their neck when it's a hot day. That'll let, let some heat escape from the plumage. But the most important trick is uh, standing on wet substrates. If on a hot day, stick your foot in, feet in a bucket of cold water, you'll start to feel more comfortable. It's that principle. Uh, if they're standing on dry ground, they're exposed to very high temperatures. The ground temperatures on dry beaches and so on get way over 41 degrees, which is body temperature of the birds. So if they're standing on dry ground, it's increasing their body temperature, not bringing it down. So it's very important for them to stand in water or on wet ground at high tide. Uh, distance from feeding areas is obviously important. Uh, the closer you are to the... F the closer from the roost to the feeding area, the better. You don't need to fly so far. You don't need to use so much energy. More energy gets invested in building up fuel for your next migration. Distance from tall cover was very important. Shorebirds don't like tall things, so uh, that, that, uh, yeah, if vegetation is more than a metre tall, it might conceal predators that are approaching, and, and birds of prey might use it as cover. So shorebirds really won't readily stand within 10 metres of anything that's tall, and they prefer to be more than 60 metres away. And background colour turned out to be a surprisingly important thing. Uh, but only at night. Uh, by day, shorebirds can see danger coming, that's fine. But at night, if you've got an owl or something like that approaching from cover of mangroves, you can't see it if it's against a ba dark background. If it's a against a white background, such as the dunes of Cable Beach, you can see it coming. Any, anyway, we modelled this. We had uh, a condi conditional logic models, which were fairly fancy, mostly for the benefit of scientific publication. Uh, and they assumed that the birds were omnipotent, that they knew everything, the condition of every roost around the bay, and then they did a complex calculation to figure out where they should roost. Actually described where knots were fit roosting very well. But we had even better models, uh, which were bounds models, which just assumed that the birds followed those simple rules above. Uh, any, anyway, they, it was... Uh, the, the, models, the, the final model was quite simple, but the, uh, it led to complex movements in the bay. So on neap tides, uh, birds always had these mud banks on the Crab Creek Flats to fly to. They could roost there by day, they could roost, to by, roost there by night, because the tides just didn't get high enough to cover those mud banks. But then on tides of intermediate heights, 6.8 to 9 metres, uh, th those uh, mud banks were covered. However, so the birds moved to the northern beaches of the Roebuck Bay, the famous roosts that appear in the tourist literature and so on. Uh, and uh, that, that's where they roost in those tide heights. But uh, st strangely enough, they don't roost there at night. And uh, we think that's because the cliffs behind those beaches are dark red and they're vegetated. Uh, they can't see predators coming. But the, the beaches, those beaches are quite lonely at night, not, not many shorebirds on them. Uh, so, so at night, they'll, uh, they'll go to one of two places. If they're feeding in the east side of the bay, they'll fly to one of these salt pans behind the mangroves. Uh, often these salt pans are dry, so they can't use them for roosting by day, but at night that doesn't matter. There's no direct solar radiation, so they'll go and roost there. Uh, 
and the birds from the west of the, bay, of the bay fly over to feed at Cable Beach. On low springs, they make use of uh, clearings in the mangroves. Uh, it's uh, very hard to get to them, but it's a lovely sight. There's these big open areas in the mangroves. Not huge areas, so the birds are quite about as close as they'd like to get to vegetation. Uh, but they'll roost there, you, you sneak in, you wait for the tide to come in, the birds burst in front of you, and then the tide just gradually rises through the mangroves at a steady walking pace, not a ripple in the water. And the birds walk inland for about 400 metres, and the tide turns, and the birds walk out for 400 metres. And uh, by the time they've got back to where they started, they know the tidal flats are free again, so they're off to feed. On, on really massive spring tides, uh, the really massive spring tides uh, are big enough to flood the salt pan so the shorebirds have somewhere to roost in those conditions and uh, they, they roost in places where, where they're hard to get to. We, we did have some practical applications for these roost choice models. We can calculate the energetic costs of roost disturbance. This table here illustrates this sort of data. This is what a, a, a lean break knot can do with 2.7 2.8 kilojoules of energy, which is what it basically gets from one big bivalve. There's enough energy in that bi bivalve to sustain a great knot while it's sleeping for six hours. But if it's, uh, if it's awake and just looking around, its brain's active, uh, it can only keep going for 217 minutes. If it's actively foraging, it can go for 159 minutes. If it's digesting food while it's foraging, that's more energy consumption and... Uh, it can keep going for 107 minutes. If it takes flight, that one bivalve will fuel 26 minutes of steady flight. But when birds uh, take off because they're disturbed, they're flying as fast as they can, they're climbing, they're wheeling around, the energy costs are much higher. So uh, one bivalve's worth of energy, it will keep a knot sleeping for six hours, but it will only keep it in flight when it's scared off for seven and a half minutes. So uh, you can see the disturbance like this, it, it looks trivial when you see it, especially in a bird that migrates from one side of the world to, to the other, but that sort of flight can be a bit of a killer for a great knot. That can stop it reaching the energy level. It can stop it from building up the fat it needs to migrate successfully. So this is why you hear lots of concern about disturbance at roosts. Uh, so uh, some disturbance studies have been done in Roebuck Bay by the hard-working volunteers of Broom Bird Observatory. Most of them ha were hard-working. Uh, I think Mr. Trudgeon was uh, looking at a beach here where the shorebirds had just been disturbed by a bird of prey, so there was nothing there. That, was, that would explain that. Um, but the study has demonstrated very high levels of shorebird disturbance in Roebuck Bay. It's one of the, there's a lot of disturbance. An awful lot of it is natural from birds of prey, but uh, human visitation is, is building the pressure. Uh, and if you calculate the energy costs of the disturbance, it's almost got to the point where shorebirds feeding in the northern side of Roebuck Bay would be better off flying 30 kilometres south to Bush Point to roost rather than staying here. So we're quite close to the edge. It's something to be monitored quite carefully in future. Uh, roost choice studies also helped us figure out the most repeatable way to do our counts. Uh, so we know exactly what Time, to, time of year to do it, we've got to do it before the wet season rains become and salt pans and so on become fl flooded and provide shorebirds with alternate roosts. We know exactly what height of tide we should count on and we've got this sort of information for the south of Roebuck Bay and for 80 Mile Beach as well. Uh, and we, we've been counting those areas systematically since 2004. We do two summer counts which are big jobs. We see two, two to three hundred thousand shorebirds during a count. We do one count in winter which is more not so many birds to count, but uh, there's more disturbance for, from birds of prey and tourists in Roebuck Bay, and the winter counts are quite tricky as well. But we've got some data we're quite happy with. Uh, oh, that describes the count methodology. Here, here's an example of uh, some of the count models we've got. This is bar-tailed godwits. In, in our entire stud area, it, it, it is going downhill. Uh, it's been going downhill at 80 Mile Beach. It's been going downhill more steeply in Roebuck Bay. And at Bush Point, it's actually been increasing, and uh, we suspect that could be a first indication of the disturbance problem. Most of the bar-tailed godwits we count in the north, in, on the northern beaches of Roebuck Bay. They, they used to be t in the east of bay, the bay towards One Tree Point. There's uh, not so much disturbance in the summer months, which is, is good for shorebirds, but uh, in, the east, in that far eastern corner of the bay, there's been some mangrove encroachment, and we don't think the roosts are as favourable as they used to be. 
it, it is actually very lucky that most of the disturbance problems on the beaches of the bay happen during the dry season. Uh, that's when there's people here, that's when birds of prey are in largest numbers, but it's luckily when the shorebirds, the adult shorebirds are mostly in Siberia, so not so many birds are affected by the dry season disturbance. Um, so that's the Roebuck Bay picture of the counts, but it's not just the local picture that's important. Uh, shorebird counts are carried out by volunteers at many Australian shorebird sites. I think Dan Weller's going to be talking about this later. Um, Roebuck Bay is one of the hardest areas to count. We've certainly got more birds than anyone else. But it, it's happening at dozens, hundreds of sites, especially in southern Australia. Um, the University of Queensland, the Australasian Way to Studies Group, Bird Life, Bird Life Australia, the Ornithological Society of New Zealand, lots of other regional groups have pulled together. We pulled together all of our data and analysed it. The analysis was led by the University of Queensland. Uh, some very important papers. Rob Clemens demonstrated that shorebird declines are occurring throughout Australia, possibly less steeply in northwestern Australia than elsewhere, but it's basically happening everywhere, so you can't attribute it, the declines all to local factors. Um, Turnus Piersma and his colleagues from NEOS demonstrated that shorebird declines are being driven by increased mortality of adults, they're just not living as long, and that this increased mortality is not happening in Australia, it's happening while they're migrating. Uh, Colin Studs demonstrated that shorebird declines coincide very closely with destruction of tidal flats in the Yellow Sea. Um, this is the Yellow Sea up here. Um, most, the most migration routes of most species seem to converge on the Yellow Sea. It's uh, incredibly rich tidal flats and very strategically placed so birds can use it as their launching point before they go off to the breeding grounds in Siberia. Uh, it's also one of the most densely inhabited er areas of the world, with China and the Koreas right next to it, uh, pop countries with very high populations. Uh, this is, uh, s these Google Earth images are Samengum, which is on the west side of South Korea, where I did a study from 2006 to 2008 with a lot of other people. Uh, what happened at Samengum? You had two rivers, the Mangyan and the Dongjin. Uh, flowing out into this fantastically rich estuary, the most shorebird-rich, benthos-rich estuary that uh, was known in this entire flyway, certainly the best I've ever seen. But also on this map, you'll see this great big seawall. Uh, at, at the start of 2006, it was still under construction. The tides were still going in. They were somewhat modified, but they were still big tides, five-metre range. You had, these grey areas were all tidal flats with crazy numbers of shorebirds on them. Um, just like flocks of 60,000 great knots. You can, when they're all flying at one point, you can hear them from two or three kilometres, just the whir of wings. It's spectacular. Uh, 2007, the seawall had been closed. These tidal flats were all underwater all the time. The, t the remaining tidal flats never got a high tide over them, so they're, they're just drying to white. Uh, shorebirds virtually gone. This is the vision for the future when they started the construction of Samengum. Now they think they're going to turn it into what they call an eco-city, but uh, it's not very eco. Uh, it's hard to imagine unless you've seen it, but uh, th this is what it looked like just after the tide started coming in. Every, e every cockle in Samengum rose to the surface and died, and the scale of it was terrible. Uh, it was actually a bonus for, sure, for knots in the first year, because all these things came to the surface and they popped open, so they had a season eating, eating carrion, a uh, migration eating carrion, but next year when they came back there was no, no, mud, fat, no mud flat to feed on. Uh, this is depressing, so I want to end by giving some reasons why I think there's hope. Uh, one of them is that shorebirds are awesome. I seem to have forgotten to fill in this slide, but that, that's actually the key message. <laughs> they're, they're, uh, they're, um, they're, they're incredibly resilient birds. They, they can find, they can find if you, a habitat comes around with suitable shorebird foraging habitat, somehow they find it. So if you destroy a roost, somehow they manage to find one somewhere else, even if it invli involves flying sort of two hours a day to get to and from it. They're, they're very resourceful. If we give them any opportunities, they'll leave them any remaining opportunities, they'll find them. Uh, I take a lot of pleasure from this, this graph in an odd sort of way. This is uh, Samengum again, or what remains of it. Just to the north of it, there's the Coombe Estuary. Uh, when we went to Samengum, we were hoping to get it stopped, but it was too late. 
billions of dollars had been invested, it was never going to, we were never going to stop it. But there was also a reclamation project uh, planned for the Coombe Estuary, which is a fantastic site, it's a beautiful area. And uh, uh, this project did get stopped. Uh, we and many other protesters kicked up such a fuss about saying that plans to reclaim the Coombe Estuary were shelved. And the Coombe Estuary is still there with its massive mudflats. I particularly like this highway here, it's a six-line highway. It runs to the coast, it just stops. Because <laughs> it was going to a development that we stopped. So It, it makes me optimistic and uh, it, it was lots of pressure groups involved, but also the Korean government sort of acknowledging, yeah, we, we've gone a bit too far. Uh, and so that's my second reason for believing them there's hope. I think governments are starting to appreciate the shore, importance of shorebirds. Uh, they, they've probably got it in Australia for quite a long time ago, although I have a, a letter from Tony Burke in uh, 2007 saying uh, the court's still out about whether shorebirds are endangered, whether reclamation's got anything to do with it, about it. But uh, Australia's moved on from that. It's well acknowledged by the Australian state governments that shorebirds are in trouble and uh, they need to do their bit to stop it. We've got strong conservation legislation, which is basic, basically followed. It's, it's not too bad in Australia by international standards. Japan has overdone its shore, but it's tidal flat reclamation. They, uh, they, they basically wiped out most of their, tidal, their really good shorebird sites. But the ones that have remain, they're now looking after very well, and they're even considering reversal of some of the tidal flat reclamations that have been done in the past. Uh, Korea's sort of followed the same economic thing. They, they want, for economic growth, massive construction. But I, I think they haven't destroyed as many of their tidal flats before they started to get wise. Uh, in 2008, they announced that they would not authorise any further reclamation. I put reclamation in inverted commas because I don't like it. Reclamation is the term people use for destroying tidal flats and converting them to land. But they're not being reclaimed as land because they never were land. Uh, China, uh, this year, Chris will be talking more about this, uh, they, they announced um, sweeping legal changes to curb commercial developments of coastal wetlands. It's, if everything that's on paper comes true, it would be unbelievably good. Of course, strong conservation words or legislation don't always turn into a effective conservation, but it, it's definitely a start. There's a framework there, where, there that uh, you can make things happen with. And that brings me to the third reason for being hopeful. Governments do have more impressive aspirations than they can handle, but when they meet their targets, it's normally because the communi community wants them to. And the shorebird community has been kicking a lot above its weight for a long time, I think. Uh, there's, uh, and the sh you know, there's a relatively small number of people who do an awful lot, but there's far more people active in the shorebird world now than there used to be. And it's not just shorebird researchers, I've talked about research because that's what I do, but there's people who lobby government, there's people who donate money to <laughs> field research and so on, mud bashers like Grant, local conservation champions like Candy and so on. We'll hit, uh, lots of people from lots of different disciplines who are doing their bit to help shorebirds in different ways. All, each one of them is important to the research and uh, there's probably people with skills that we've not thought of there, but uh, if the, the, the key thing is that we, if the shorebird message is getting out to more and more people, more and more people are getting interested and in bringing their skills in. And uh, that does make me helpful, because as long as there's a community of people who are really like their shorebirds, we, we'll have shorebirds in the future, I'm quite confident of it. And I think that's probably it. Uh, so I would like to thank Yaruru and formerly Rubibi for welcoming us to study shorebirds on their land the conference organisers, because I got a free flight out of this conference, <laughs> uh, Broom Bird Observatory, the AWSG and NEOS have been absolutely central to uh, all shorebird research done in Port Phillip Bay with lots of support also from the Global Network and the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions. Uh, we've had hundreds of volunteers that have helped us and I'd especially like to feel, thank Phil Batley Patron de Cooey, Chris Hassel, Clive Minton, Grant Pearson, Turnus Piersmer and Ken Rogers who've been a big part of all the projects that I've been the most deep, deeply involved with. Thank you.